Hey, John and Mike from Boo-Dudes.com. This week we're drinking dark beer. <laughs> Look at the head on that thing. Look at that thing. It, this is it, oatmeal stout, baby. This is a cucumber stout? This is a cucumber stout. Nice, bro. No, it's not a cucumber stout. Not mm. yet. Not soon yet? To That's soon later? To be, soon to be. You're going to like infuse cucumber and put it in there? Um, I That's should really great. sample these beers before we video because what it's changing? I guess this is changing, changing before your beer. ears, so and nose, and mouth. So this is oatmeal stout. Nothing too special in terms of recipe. I've brewed this beer before, but let me give the quick recipe so people at home can follow along. This is a ten pounds of American two row, raw two row to be specific. I like a pound and a half of oats. I didn't toast any oats this time. No toasting. I went a pound and a half of oats, ten ounces of pale chocolate. I went six ounces of roasted barley and six ounces of black patent. I just wanted to play with that roasted yeah, yeah. barley black patent thing. Um, and I did four ounces of, of Crystal 40 and four ounces of Crystal 60. I wanted half a pound of Crystal, but I figured break it up for some complexity. Um, and I also threw some rice hulls in there because in my system, I didn't yeah. want to get frustrated. Stuck. I put some rice hulls in there. Okay. Um, and just for people who are interested, um, the roasted malts, the chocolate, the roasted barley, and the black patent, I top mash those, which again, yes. we've covered it before. I do the mash with all the pale malts, and then 20 minutes before I mash out, Put the, the stuff goes in the top and I'm recirculating, and it goes from yellow to bing, this. I, we'll talk about this, but we'll I, 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 I want I want a cold mash. Do you ever do like take your. I haven't tried that yet. I'm going to try that. I have something okay. that's coming up. Well, not total spoiler alert. Make a note. Say. Make a note. Make a note. There's something coming. Um, well, this is another one of these styles, a uh, Mike Oops. Warren classic style. It's it's like his cream ale that I've had probably you know nine, ten thousand times. But uh, this is a oh, signature wow. Mike Warren style. Um, I'm I'm sensing there was no corn in this one either. There's no corn. Yeah. So, um, but this is good. I you know I was when you said black patent mm -hmm. when you actually said that then, of course that lit a, a little fire in my brain. And then I said, okay, well, it's, I can't taste that, you know, acridy black patent taste. If you said it wasn't in there, I wouldn't have guessed. That's but it, good. That's good news. You know, I mean, I... A lot of people poo-poo on the black right, patent and the stout, you know, mm -hmm. just for traditional reasons. But, you know, this is homebrewing. Yeah. Do what you like. I'm, I, you know, this is a recipe that I, you know, I'm, I'm experimenting with still, too. I'm trying to learn for myself. How all these different roasted malts play together. Yeah, and, 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 and the like caramel malts too. I would, I'm going to come back to this beer. I'm going to brew it again. I'm probably going to go pale chocolate roasted bar. I'm going to drop the black patent. Or maybe I'm going to try one of those other new things like black prince or something. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. You know, Midnight wheat. <laughs> all the ones that are like, you know, deep bitter. Yeah. yeah. You and your smash brew, and I'm going to do that. roasted smash. Right. I don't know what that is. But. <laughs> yeah, the way the emphasis is really on the, the M and not the H, right? right? Well, I, you know, this is a, uh, it's a tremendous little beer. Um, certainly has the slickness of uh, what I would expect in, an, in a, an oatmeal stout, meaning like it's got that oily kind of, um, you know, smooth aftertaste. Mm, uh, yeah, smooth, that's for yeah. sure. Um, and it's got a, a the, pers the head is just persistent, you know, it's nice. It's got some nice lacing yeah, on it's that. It's hanging in there. That's yeah, great. Um, and I think that the, the caramel malts play really nicely with the roasted ones. And I think that's what I'm looking for in, in, a, in, a, in a stout, too. Because the ones I've made, like the really small stouts, the ones that have like kind of you know, low gravity, they don't really call for a lot of uh, caramel malts. And um, it seems like there's something lacking. You know, like you get a nice English, maybe, you know, pale malt base. And then you put in like some chocolate... Uh, some roasted barley, and that's about it. And yeah. that's right. I only know with half a pound of crystal malts in general, and I wanted that. I want you know I wanted all that, almost a pound and a half of, of roasted stuff. I wanted the roast to be right out in front. Yep. yep. Um, but not overly aggressive, so which is why I went with the pale chocolate too. Okay. Which I think it's got a tremendous like toasty character. Yeah, man, and and that's great. But there's something more to this beer that uh, you oh. know that we aren't telling people just yet no. because. You know, this is, it's all about learning from each other. So what did you do differently outside? I mean, I think the recipe is fairly standard for what yep. you've brewed before, but there was a technique you used, and you were about to tell people what, what, what'd you do? So, what'd you I, do? Think, I think we may have alluded to What's it in, the box? in a few videos back. Um, I wanted to try to brew this beer in a completely post-fermentation closed system. Right. So no we oxygen. had a video where we talked about low oxygen, yeah. and there's some crazy stuff going on with getting oxygen out of your mash, out of your boil, 
I'm not interested in that. But I wanted to try to keep the oxygen as low as I could post fermentation. So okay. I have a corny keg that I used to use as a bright tank, meaning I trimmed about two and a half inches off the dip tube. Mm. What I used to do is I'd put finished beer in there, gelatinize it to cold crash it, and every, anything that settled to the bottom I could push out with that shortened dip tube and not take up any of this stuff. But I've, I've read a lot about fermenting in a corny keg using the same type of setup. So this beer, in short, this beer went into the corny keg. I uh, fermented it in there fully. And then I took another corny keg that I filled with sanitizer, all the way up with sanitizer, put the lid on, and then I used CO2 from my keg system to push that sanitizer out of the keg. So now that keg was completely full of CO2, mm -hmm. no oxygen. Yep. Then I used a black to black with like a six inch tube jumper. Okay, so black to black. Oh, yeah, so long output. dip tube yeah. to long dip tube. Okay. Um, so that keg was full of CO2. And what I did is I went from uh, beverage out to beverage out. I put CO2 pressure on the fermentation keg that mm -hmm. had the oatmeal stout in it. You pushed that and out. And pushed it over. Right. And you have to ask yourself, well, how did you get it to push <laughs> if, the, if the receiving keg was sealed? I took a a gas connector mm. with a with a long tube that, and I put that in a pitcher of water. So that was my airlock. So as the beer moved over and the CO2 had to escape, it bubbled through the thing, but that was an airlock just like a bubbler right. on your, Wouldn't let on any your air carbon, air right? Yeah, yeah. And um, and so what did I use for an airlock when I fermented? That's what I was I gonna used, ask you. I used the same setup, which was yeah. a gray connector on the, the gas out tube yeah. in a pitcher of sanitizer. Huh. And so so some of the some of the disadvantages <laughs> of being in a corny keg to ferment uh -huh. is it's a small volume and it's a tight space. And so I did get a pretty good yeast blow off I see. coming up to the thing. But the cool thing was, um, whenever I had yeast get up into your airlock in the past, you've got to take the thing off and, and cover the cardboard. Maybe you don't cover it. I don't know. You cover it with foil or you put a new cardboard cap on it and you wash that thing out. And then you got to sanitize it. Yep. You, but for this, all I did was like, well, look, at, I just grabbed the the, the beverage connector, yep. the gas connector, and took it off. Yeah. And by doing that, the the thing is sealed. So you don't have to like worry about stuff falling Coming into in, the carboy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or you know, if you use a stopper in a glass carboy, um, stuff can settle on that rim, and when you pull it off, it goes in your beer. So. It's completely closed. I just took it off. I took the hose off. I rinsed it through my sink with the water. Got all that yeast out of the thing. Right. Then I put it back in the pitcher of sanitizer mm -hmm. and put it and rinsed off the connector. Put it back on. Boom. Um, when I opened the keg post fermentation, there was definitely Krausen all the way up under the lid and everything. Sure. So I definitely had a good full. You know. Yeah. One of the other disadvantages is I didn't put five gallons in there. I put about four and a quarter in there. Otherwise, I probably would have had a, a really big yep. blow off. So. So you have to do a smaller batch. Um, that is sort of a disadvantage if you really want to have five gallons of beer. Um, but you know what I've noticed over many years of brewing is that I usually end up with like a gallon, half a gallon, a gallon and a half of beer that sits in a keg. It gets to be like four months, five months old, and I'm on to other beers, brewing other beers, drinking other beers, that at that point, I end up pouring that beer out anyway. So brewing a four and a half gallon batch, you know, it's less beer, but it's not a big deal. And if, I figured if I ever wanted to make sure I still had the thing, the, a full five gallons, I could still brew a six gallon batch and just go three gallons into two different kegs and then push them together into one receiving keg later on if I needed that. If I really felt like I needed a five gallon batch. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I thought it was super cool. <laughs> um, I, uh, so we'll have to try this in, you know, uh, six or seven months and see if there's any oxidation, which probably wouldn't happen. Yeah, so that's another thing. Even though the black malt you know, supposedly helps with being an antioxidant. Hmm. Um, I think I can already tell in here, because I usually end up leaving my beers in the carboys way too long. Uh, I just don't get to them. But in this system, I don't have to clean a racking can. I don't need to figure out which piece of tubing I should yeah. use. Because that, all that, that equipment is contained in the keg. The dip tube, the connectors, it's great. I even oxygenated with a, a, a beverage out black connector on my oxygen bottle. Really? And glue and I, it in there? The, the, I had the lid off, and yep. I just put it on there and let it bubble through the keg. Ah. And then what I did, too, and I think it led to a really great fermentation, is 
Um, I let it bubble for like 30 seconds, then I put the lid on and captured a little bit more of that, that O2 in the headspace of the keg for another like 10 seconds and then disconnected it and I was good to go. Um, and I already put my yeast in there after I, right before I closed it. So I used a, you know, ferment this SO4 because I like that in this. And, and, that, and it was fermenting faster than I think I've normally seen it ferment in a carboy. So I think, just think I captured a good amount of oxygen. That's great. So That's great. So, so it was cool. So, I mean, so of all the other advantages, of all the advantages this gave you, yep. what do you think is the biggest one? I mean, outside of the oxidation factor, for me, lack of oxidation. For me, I think that we'll, we'll see how the lack of oxygen exposure in time bears out with a couple more recipes. Um, I'm gonna, definitely going to do it for a couple more beers and just see, get my process down a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I like, I just mentally find it a lot more convenient to just have a keg and not be using racking equipment and having to sanitize racking equipment and then purging a keg with CO2 or purging a cardboard with CO2 if you want to do a secondary or something. Mm. Just, it's, it's all contained. I just found it mentally easier to just, all right, I'm going to rack this beer and I just put it on the floor and I hooked up my CO2 and yep. I just started pushing it. Yep. It did feel a little bit weird to be burning so much CO2 to move sanitizer and then move the beer around, but um, that's the price I gotta pay. That's the price I gotta pay. I think a few more recipes will bear out whether or not I think it's easier or not. So, but I, I thought it was cool. I shot a little bit of side video that's yeah. you know in there earlier. Well, I'll, I'll put that in the video ahead. You've probably already seen it. So. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been done post production. All right, man. This is very cool. It was cool, yeah. Love the technique. And the beer came out good, too. Yeah, hey, yeah, <laughs> besides that. All right, well, thanks a lot for watching. Uh, please uh, like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. We try to do this every week, guys um, and gals. It's uh, John and Mike, brew-dudes.com. Brew on. Cheers.